Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. Wisdom, wisdom is the principal thing. Say that out loud. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. With all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference. Difference in people. Difference in a moment. Difference in an environment. Difference in opportunity. Because everything arrives from God camouflaged as an opportunity. An opportunity to learn. An opportunity to change. An opportunity to hear. An opportunity to earn. Opportunity is a fabulous word because everything you're wanting is hidden in a little package called opportunity. Opportunity is an invitation to an experience. Opportunity is an invitation to an experience. 2012 for this family is the year of great opportunities, great invitations to change, to learn, to produce, to prosper. What is wisdom? The ability to see difference. The, the blind man cried out to Jesus, have mercy on why. He knew the difference in that moment. The thief hanging next to Jesus said, would you remember me? And in a sentence, altered divine plans. And God said, today you'll be with me in paradise. One of the greatest things I've learned in my life is that what I'm saying decides God's plans. God planned to destroy Nineveh, but they began to call on God. He changed his plans. One conversation can turn God from an enemy to a friend. Hallelujah. What's the dominant reason for wisdom? To know difference. Your difference from someone else. If you can't tell me your difference from someone else in a sentence, you have not yet discovered your difference, which means you're living life unrewarded because it's your difference that attracts reward. You didn't marry your wife because she reminded you of an old girlfriend. She was not like your old girlfriend. Consistently listen for difference in a conversation. I listen for four things. I listen for the sound of pain. Because pain is an invitation to participate in a life. When I hear the sound of pain, I know that wherever there's a problem, there's a future. Wherever there's a problem, there's an opportunity. Money is anywhere, there's a problem. To be out of a job is absurdity. Absurd, ridiculous, ludicrous. Everywhere there's a problem, you got a job. Can you recognize? That's wisdom. Recognize difference. The dominant purpose of wisdom is to know who to honor. I cannot change your life till I change whose voice you honor. What is honor? Rewarding someone for their difference. So you listen for difference. You look for difference. Difference in a moment. Difference in an opportunity. What's different about this day? What I want the day to be like. We'll talk about that. Because every morning you should prophesy to your day and you tell your day what to do. God's given you the ability to rename everything in your life. God brought you to the garden of the world and he said, whatever you want something to be, I'll make it. You could rename it. The first thing I want to know about you if I meet you is who do you honor? Because that's the only thing on God's mind. The Ten Commandments are all about honor. Honor is rewarding someone for their difference. I went to my safe and I got a stack of money and to give to my father wasn't a whole lot, but it was a stack and I don't know about you, but I get excited when I see stacks of money. I just do. Now, many people are not pleasured by that. They say, money won't make you happy. To me, just the, just the sight of it is exciting. 
So I walked over next door and I handed my daddy a stack of money because I like to do that. I like to, and I like new money. I don't like old money. I don't know why, but I just don't like dirty, old, greasy, diseased money. But I like brand new money. I, I tell my bank, get me new money. Get me new money. I want new money, new $2 bills, new $5 bills, new $10 bills. I like new. Why? I'm the offspring of a God who loves new. Even his mercies are new. God likes new. I'm going to shock you when you find out that heaven's really a mall. <laughs> Say, I like new. I like oh, I do. I saw a sign, Pastor, in a bookstore said, Real men hate shopping. I thought, wow, I had no idea I was half woman. <laughs> I like shopping. And my, <laughs> my dad looked at that stack of money and he, oh, he just, his eyes just lit up. Just smiled, and somebody came and said, can I have one? He went, <laughs> honor is all about rewarding somebody for their difference. When daddy comes over to my library where I work at my house, he always, I always bring him chocolate because he loves chocolate milk. Why, he's my father. He can have anything he wanted. When I found out he wanted the house next door, I bought it for him. I've kept him in cars. Why, I, he's my father. He brought me to Jesus, he brought me to school. He brought me into the world. The first four commandments out of the 10 deal with honoring God. The last six deal with honoring people. The Bible is a book about decisions. Turn to page five. Turn to page five in your book, The Seven Decisions. The Bible is a book about decisions. 331 times it tells you if like Isaiah 119, if I'm willing and obedient, I shall eat the good of the land. Success is not destiny because destiny is something you cannot change. But real destiny, and I love what this says over here. This is one of the most spectacular statements here. Destiny is no matter of chance. It's a matter of choice. Is that William Jennings, Brian? It is not a thing to be waited for. My decisions create my destiny in reality. Isaiah 117 says, learn to do well. So my success is not a decision of God. Now, I think this is me. I think the purpose of wisdom is to distinguish between a divine decision and a human decision. There's some things God decide. Obviously, he undecided everything on the earth because it's a mess. So your decisions, the purpose of your decisions is to prevent loss and to create gain. Avoid loss and create gain. Let's talk about these seven decisions. Number one, let's read it aloud. Your decision to build your faith. Say that aloud. Say it again. Faith comes... And it goes. <laughs> it comes by hearing and it leaves by hearing. What is faith? Confidence in God. And it's an attitude of confidence toward God, his character, his words. And my faith is something I have to build. Nobody else is responsible for my confidence in God. I am. Now, why is faith so important in your life? It's the only thing that attracts the favor of God. God's only need is to be believed. God only wants to be believed. He hadn't asked you to rebuild the mansions in heaven. He hadn't asked you to reconstruct the earth. He just wants you to believe his voice. In my opinion, the most important part of the Bible, the most important verse in all the 800,000 words of the Bible is Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Now, why is faith important for you? Because your faith is sculpturing your future. Your future will be produced by your doubts or your faith in God, faith in God's character, faith in the laws of God. Psalms 112, 1, 2, and 3 says, A man that loves the law of God, wealth and riches would be in his house. 
you must work with your faith. Now, every day you're getting a deposit from someone. Someone is speaking faith into you or unbelief. God is so infuriated by being doubted that for every one of the 40 days, the 10 spies doubted God. When they spied out the land of Canaan, God gave them a year of pain. Doubt produces tragedy like faith produces rewards and miracles. Work with your faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the loud. Real loud. Real loud. God said, I've made my words pregnant with confidence in me. God's words. God, in my opinion, and I'm saying this because I can't, God has hidden himself in his words. He puts himself in his words. And when I say something God says, I feel what God feels. Faith comes when you hear God talk. That's why on all my little iPods and my iPad and everything I have, I soak my environment with God's words. I love his words on my wall. I call it scripturalizing my house where you order the kind of wallpaper that has your favorite scriptures in it and put it. You can customize wallpaper, but you want to scripturalize your environment. I don't go through my house commanding the devil to leave. He doesn't even enjoy being there. When everything in my house, when you walk in, reminds you of God's power, God's presence. You've got to build your faith. In every conversation, it must build your faith. God gave you a mouth to conquer your mind. Let's go to another one. Go to page nine. Page nine, chapter two. Say it aloud. Your decision to excel in your present assignment. Again. Your pastor loves order. That's the purpose of divine instructions is to birth order, the accurate arrangement of things. Are you excelling in your present assignment? If you're in the prison, you don't just keep it clean, but you start investing in that environment. What do I mean by assignment? My watch solves a problem. My eyes see. My ears hear. They have different assignments. My mouth doesn't get upset with my ear because it doesn't speak. My mouth doesn't say to my ear, are you stupid? You don't say a word. You just hang there on the side of his head. No. Everything created solves a problem. The problem you were designed to solve is called your assignment. If my name is Aaron, my assignment's to Moses. If my name is Moses, my assignment's to the Israelites. Your assignment is always to a person or a group of people. Your assignment is always to solve a problem. You must excel in your present assignment because today is the seed for tomorrow. God gives us tomorrows. Tomorrows as fruit of our seeds today. Are you excelling? I got so upset with people talking about not having jobs. I went on the internet and I said, I want to help you get a job. You'll get it in seven days. You'll get it in seven days. Obviously, you want to master a knowledge about the company you apply to. You don't walk in and say, I don't know anything about your company. Number one, ask the guy, tell the guy that you're talking to, said, number one, I want you to always, and this, you will never have to repeat an instruction to me. Number two, I will complete every instruction you give me. I'm a completer. Number three, I'm very agreeable. You can put me anywhere in this, anywhere in this company, anywhere, and I can get along with anybody. 
And number four, I'm easy to correct. I want you to make me your protege. I begin to get emails from everywhere in the world. People got jobs in three days, two days, one day, of course. You tell a man that you want to work for, you will only have to tell me an instruction once. Suppose I have three assistants and I make the statement, I love carrot juice. Boy, I wish I had some carrot juice. And my first assistant says, I like carrot juice too. I sure like to have some too, Dr. Murray. <laughs> assistant number two says, if I had some carrots, I'd make you some. Assistant number three says, I'll be right back. Comes back. By the way, I love your collars there, son. That is spectacular collar. When I get on my jet to go somewhere, which one of the three do you think I want with me? Number one, right? Who says he liked carrot juice too? No. Number two then, because he said if he had some carrots, you're pretty smart, aren't you? Number three. Somebody writes you checks just for doing their instructions. Think of the people who give you instructions and they never write you a check. Think of the policeman standing there at the corner and said, and you sit and wait. But he don't write you a check, does he? Think of your mama. Clean up your room. She writes you a check. But out of the whole earth, six billion people, there is a man or a woman who says, I am so prosperous that if you follow my instructions, I'll give you money every day. That's a, kind, that's a pretty good man. Or woman. Do you excel in your assignment? Do you have to be told something twice? Three times. If your boss has to tell you something four times, you don't qualify for a salary. We give you an allowance because you're a kid. <laughs> Chapter 3, verse thir uh, page 13. Your decision to honor the scriptural chain of authority. Read it out loud. Your decision to honor the scriptural chain of authority. Blessing flows down. It don't flow up. It flows down. Ezekiel says it, my response to a man of God of the house that the blessing might come upon me. When I discovered that all I had to do was honor my mother and father and it would go well with me all my life, that was a breakthrough for me. That was a breakthrough. Whose voice do you honor? Whose voice do you trust? When your mother gives you an instruction, do you obey her? You don't? Ooh, son, I, I see a whipping coming up. <laughs> the chain of, everybody say the chain of authority. Chain of say it again. Chain of you ever watch the news and they're chasing a man who's going fast on the freeway? Now, I don't run that department, so don't ask me about it. I have no idea why they don't call ahead or put little spikes in the front so he has, they would rather follow him for 110 miles. But finally, the man runs out. You've seen it, Pastor. The man, the helicopter showing all of us. And boy, we stop our meal. We stop everything watching this incredible, fascinating event in life. A stupid man running from a bullet. Now here's, and you watch this man and he's in the car and he's driving and the, and the commentator on the TV says, yeah, this, this is 50 miles so far. The police are calling him right now and, and they're, they're following him right now and, and this man is, uh, they don't know why they think he may be on drugs. And, and eventually the man, of course, crashed. And when he runs into a post, like a light post on the freeway or something, he gets out and starts running. <laughs> Where have you seen such an optimist in your lifetime? A man who believes, I can outrun a bullet. That's what kind of man you want in your life, right? No. This is a man who has no concept of authority. 
crazy. That's why the prisons are full. Not because none of them had a mommy. None of them had a daddy. But nobody trained them in the law of honor. What's the most important thing you can do for your child? Train them in honor. To love God? No, to honor you first. They hadn't met God. God hadn't hung around your house yet. They're too young, but they know you. God said, I'm going to share my secrets with Abraham because he's trained his children to follow him. Boy, when I see dishonor, I either train if there's hope or I terminate if there's not. Because if somebody won't honor my instructions when I'm writing them checks, imagine what they'll do to people who don't write them checks. I don't know how I got off on that, Pastor. Something must be on my mind. Page 17. Page 17, your decision to pursue an uncommon mentor. Everybody read out loud. One, two, three. Your decision to pursue an uncommon mentor. Well, why doesn't he pursue me? Because he doesn't need you. You need him. Duh. Yeah. I'm not sure God made everybody. I've, I've met people so stupid, there's no way God could have made them. I, 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 I really have a problem with that. I really have, I'm not sure God made everybody. How many has met people that you're not quite sure God really did make them? What is mentorship? Learning from somebody else instead of an experience. Experience is the slowest way to learn. It's the slowest way to get wisdom. Mentorship is like Elijah teaching Elisha. Ruth was the protege of Naomi. Mentorship is learning through somebody else's pain. Think about that for that. That's pretty powerful. Mentorship is learning through somebody else's loss. Time does not create wisdom. We have 15-year-old Christians and 80 year old sinners so white hair doesn't mean you got a brain it means somebody showed you mercy who's mentoring you whose voice matters to you I carry 3,200 books with me everywhere I go I read to 2 and 3 o'clock this morning why there's so much I don't those who have what you don't have know something you don't know. What's your investment in wisdom? I would never spend more money on clothes than I would in my mind. My mind is my garden. I kill snakes. I pull weeds. I grow flowers. I remember the most I've ever spent in a day in a bookstore is $10,000 in one day. Why? There's so much I don't know. There's so much I don't know. I'm 90% protege and 10% mentor. I consider myself a professional learner. People say, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm a learner. My banker said, what's your hobby? I said, I, I learn. I learn for a living. I'm a learner. Three parts of mentorship. What do you want to master? What topic do you want to master? What do you want to learn more about than anything on the earth? Do I want to learn everything? Of course not. I'm not going to study how to raise skunks how to raise possums, how to grow big turtles. 
there's so much I'm not interested in. And your success is determined by what you're willing to ignore. So you choose a focus. I chose wisdom. You may choose mercy, the subject of raising children. But what subject do you want to master? Two, what, what will you do with the knowledge you gather? I keep a little recorder with me, a phone recorder, so I can send everything. Because if I talk into it, it will type right what I'm speaking. It types it immediately in front of me. And so I store my discoveries. And everything I speak that goes right, net, right into an application, an app called Evernote, immediately is in all of my six computers. So if somebody steals it, it's in another one. I put it in front of me. I put in front of me what I want to become. Never put in front of you what you don't want in you. I put in front of me what inspires me. I schedule my inspiration. Can you imagine what you could accomplish if you could keep yourself inspired? Do you realize the only thing you really have to know in life is how to keep yourself inspired? I went through my house. I moved every picture that didn't excite me. Relatives on the family wall that when I saw their face, well, Mike, why did you have it up there? Because I thought you were supposed to have all the members of your family up there. No, you only put on your walls what excites you. I don't care if the colors match. I don't care if the picture is the right size for that wall. Does it inspire you? You don't have extra time to invest in people who don't inspire you. I wanted a certain kind of table, so I told my people, we said it was uh, Thanksgiving a year ago, and we were putting things around the house. I had 14, 15 of my staff around, and I said, I, I don't like this little table. It looks shrimpy. It looks crazy. But I found on the Internet another one over here at uh, uh, a store, so here's $900 to go get the table. And one of my people, she's really precious, but she was tr she's one of those kind of women that want to talk you out of what you like. You ever met one of those guys? <laughs> and after about three times of telling her, no, go get that table. Dr. Mike, I think this looks good. I, like I said, this is my house. Finally, I just stopped. I said, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. I turned on one of my assistants. I said, go put that song on. Find it, put it on, and play it in all the speakers. I want you to play it until Christmas Day or until Jesus returns. I'll let you know. But start it right now. It's a song straight from the heart of God. Nobody believes it, but it's, oh, what a song. What a song. And suddenly, and within two minutes, that song was blaring through the house. This is the way, uh-huh, uh-huh, I like it. <laughs> Have you ever heard a greater song in your life? This is the way, uh-huh, uh-huh, I like it. Everybody, this is the way. Don't you ever spend another hour without a recorder in your hand. In my opinion, the most important success habit on the earth is relentless recording. Relentless recording. Every idea, every thought, every, every discovery. I consider the greatest discovery of my whole lifetime is that the most important thing you will do every, every day of your life is ask questions. I consider asking questions to be the most important thing in the universe. You say, I think God is. No, no, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even look for God if you didn't ask questions. 
ASK, ask, seek, knock, three levels of passion. Keep a question list. Questions create relationships, change seasons. A question decides what you are willing to stop doing. The most important thing you will do all day today is ask questions. The mind gathers data connected to your questions. Jesus loved questions so much he answered questions with questions. Page 21, chapter 5, page 21. Your decision to look for divine rewards in every battle. Say that out loud. Your decision to look for divine rewards in every battle. Until you have an enemy, you don't have a future. An adversary is the proof of progress. When you ask God for a future, he will schedule an enemy to qualify you. Until Goliath showed up, David was locked into a lifetime position as a shepherd boy. An enemy is not a wall. An enemy is a door. An enemy is a divine announcement that God has finished your present season. And tomorrow is about to begin. Everywhere there's a future, there's an adversary. An adversary is a proof Satan discovered your future. Now, the devil is not omnipresent. You already know that. He's not God Jr. He's not God with evil intentions. He's an ex-employee who got fired from leading the choir. <laughs> Satan cannot be everywhere. There's days you don't feel like there's a devil around. Why? He's not. Daniel prayed 21 days. Pastor, I was not hungry until you started talking about the Daniel's fast. <laughs> and for some reason, I had pictures in my mind of Chinese food, <laughs> tacos and enchiladas. I found my partner over here somewhere here. <laughs> When there's a battle, the first time, the first thing you do when there's an enemy is you say, what have I done wrong? Have I left a door open? Have I been vulnerable? Have I made a mistake? Enemies increase your attentiveness to accuracy. Enemies make you careful. They make you meticulous. Enemies help you discover your weakness and where you need to be reinforced. Never discuss your enemy's victories with other people. Never announce all your enemy's intentions. Never participate in his destruction of you. When you have an adversary, identify them. Identify your adversary. Then call an intercessor and say, I need for you to pray with me that Psalms 91 will take place. Hallelujah. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Even Jesus had enemies. Identify your enemy, but don't discuss him with everybody. I'm writing a book, How to Have Supper with Judas. You're going to have to be comfortable. Maturity is the ability to, have, to be in the presence of an enemy without discussing him. You've got, to, everybody's going to have a Judas. Everybody's going to have an Absalom. None of the other disciples, Jesus did not bring them into his confidence and say, let me tell you about the one here that's going to do me dirty. He protected their focus, but he knew who his Judas was. And if a conversation could change your Judas, God would have had a conversation with Lucifer instead of booting him out.
6. Turn to page 25. You got five more minutes? Your decision to continuously listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Say that out loud. Your decision to continuously listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I was trying to buy some land. I went to the secret place and said, Holy Spirit, this man's been so hard to deal with. He's just, he's just absolutely made it, which he did. I had to make every concession. He made none. But I wanted the land so bad. I wanted the real estate so bad. I was willing to do anything. And I went by the secret place on the way to sign papers. And I said, Holy Spirit, I, I don't feel good about this land. When you don't feel excited, stop and consider. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm not in this transaction. I said, what do you mean? He said, there's no favor here. I talk through favor. I talk through favor. Where do you have favor? This man doesn't like you. You don't need to buy his land. Huh? I want it. I said, stop it somehow. So on the way, the... The realtor said, Dr. Murdoch, I hate to tell you this, but there's one more thing. He said, if you don't do this, he will not sell you the land. He said, I hate it. He's made it so hard for you. I said, really? So that was my way out. But a few months later, I had another deal come up, and I liked it, and it was good. And the Lord said, see, there's favor. I, didn't even, I, I wasn't even planning. It was too big of a thing. And I thought, I can't do this. And, and the Holy Spirit says, there's favor. See, God talks through peace. He talks through opportunity. Opportunity is a divine voice. God never told David to fight Goliath. Never did. David just saw a chance to get a reward. He saw opportunity. David didn't fight Goliath. What's the first question that David asked when he heard Goliath cussing? What does a guy get if he kills him? Number one, he gets a woman, most beautiful woman here, the king's daughter. Gets a pile of money, doesn't have to pay taxes the rest of his life. David said, I'll be right back. He was very reward-oriented. You want to develop reward consciousness. And the Holy Spirit says, this man likes you. He's giving you a good deal. And 24 hours later, I had a $4 million profit in a single day. You know, I would have never thought you had a jealousy problem in this church. I would have never thought that. I, I never picked that up in the worship. Never picked that up. How many is happy for my blessing? Give me a hand clap. I, thank you. Pastor, the Holy Spirit told me one night in a service Sunday night to invest $8,500. It was a money um, that had just come in from royalty. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me, how would you like to explore and experiment what I could do with your 85? Six weeks later, after my, my $800, $500, say $8,500, God spoke to me in prayer with an idea. I called a businessman friend. He said, I'll put that in the stores. He signed contracts with Walmart, Kmart, and uh, Hallmark. And I started getting royalty checks every 90 days. The first royalty check built me a gymnasium at my house. The second royalty check bought me a Rolls Royce, black on black, cash. When God talks, you'll profit. You will profit. And God doesn't scream. He doesn't throw you down on the floor and say, did you hear that, what I said? <laughs> this year of great opportunities means you become a radar for the path of favor, for the path of new ideas, for the path of opportunity. Seven and we'll close. Go turn to page 29. Read it out loud. Your decision to sow seed with expectation of a specific harvest. Now, everybody sows. Everybody. Because everything's a seed, including nothing. Nothing's a seed. A seed of nothing creates a season of nothing. 
One day, Oral Roberts was driving me through Tulsa, and I said, Brother Roberts, what is the greatest secret of your lifetime? I remember him saying, Mike, I don't think anybody's ever asked me that. He said, sowing my seed for a desired result. None of us probably have had much teaching, unless you've been to this church, on sowing with expectation of a harvest. We've been taught to sow, but we haven't been taught to sow with expectation of a specific harvest. God had a son, he wanted a family. He planned his son to create a family. The farmer has corn, puts it in the ground for, for corn. The young husband puts a seed in the womb of his wife and a child is born. You're a walking collection of seeds. My words are the seeds for my feelings. Listening is my seed for knowledge. Knowledge is the seed for changes. Repentance is the seed for forgiveness. Battle is the seed for territory. I'm a walking factory of seeds. There will never be a day in my life I don't sow. And there'll never be a time in my life I have nothing to sow. He said, I give seed to a sower but I give a harvest to a receiver. I want you to get your expectations up. It's not enough to sow. I've got to get you expecting. First Kings 17, what's the first thing that Elijah did? What's the first thing he did? He took a paintbrush and he painted on the walls of her mind, the widow of Zarephath. The cruise of oil will not fail. The meal barrel will not run dry. Peter mutters to Jesus, we've given up everything to follow you. And Jesus could have said, right, three catfish in a boat. But he didn't. He said, anything you give up for me will come back 100 fold. Malachi 3, bring the tithes into the storehouse. Why? Because these angels are eating more than I ever dreamed. No. He said, I want the authorization to be God. See if I won't open the windows of heaven. Pour you out a blessing. I'll become an adversary to your adversaries. I'll rebuke the devourer. Why is God so much into this expectation? A man came to me and said, Brother Mike, when I give to God, I expect nothing in return. I said, I wrote a little song for you. How? dumb thou art, how dumb thou art. I don't want to ruin that song for you, but it... hold your checkbook in your hand. Hold your wallet in your hand, would you? If you don't have a wallet, draw a picture of one in the back of your Bible. Stroke your checkbook. A man wrote me the other day and tweeted me on Twitter. He said, I watched you on TV. You talked for one hour about money. Why? I said, the same reason you worked 40 hours this week for. <laughs> 2012 is not my year for stupid. It is not my year for stupid. It's the year of great opportunities. I said, it's my year for great opportunities. I'm going to pray for three harvests over your life. I'm going to pray for three harvests over your life. Number one, for a debt-free home that no government can take away from you. I want to pray for you, God, to give you a home that your enemies can't get out of their head. I want God to give you such a home that they will hire, 
they will hire helicopters to fly over your house and take pictures of you. If your enemies are not thinking about you, we've got to get you blessed. Say a debt-free home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you picture, can you picture walking through your house with a debt-free home? With a debt-free home. Hallelujah. House you want everybody to see. A house that makes your friends not want to leave your house when they come to visit. Number two, a sevenfold return of anything Satan has stolen from you. A thief, when he is found, must return sevenfold. Hallelujah. Say sevenfold return. Anything Satan has taken from you, the thief has to return. So your focus is not surviving a loss. It's expectation of a sevenfold return where God turns the loss into a seed for a sevenfold return. Third, that God will put a financial Boaz in your environment. You don't need everybody liking you. You just need one person liking you. There's people that like you and you hadn't prospered one day because of it. <laughs> Say financial Boaz. Say it again. Just one person deciding to be good to you. Just one person says, I like you. Just one person said, you qualify for a reward, sister. A man was in my office the other day, library, and he said, they called somebody's name. I didn't even know his last name. He works for our ministry, but I, I didn't really know his full name, and I don't see him much. And they said, you know what he does for you? And I said, no. He does this, he does that. Wow. I said, really? And you know, Brother Ron, who he is? And uh, I said, really? Oh, he does this, he does that. He said, you can't believe how much. I said, really? I said, I'm a firm believer that two things. Number one, God leaves no man unrewarded. And I insist that nobody in my world goes unrewarded. I call, I said, get this man a bonus and raise his salary until somebody comes. You don't need everybody liking you. You just need the right person liking you. Your future begins one person from right now. You are one person from your future. Hallelujah. Rebecca didn't need a thousand relatives liking her. All she needed was Eliezer to look at her and said, I like this woman. She offered to water my camels. Hallelujah. Now, the Bible is a book about receiving, as you know. God brought Adam to an Adam, the Garden of Eden and said, I want you to receive a garden, then I want you to receive a wife. The whole Bible is a book about receiving. John 1, 12 said, I came into his own, his own received him not, but to as many as received him. God's looking for receivers. Say, I receive those three harvests. Say it again. Say it again. A debt-free home, sevenfold return, and a financial Boaz in my life. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to pray two prayers over your life. First, I'm going to pray that 2012 is the year of consistent tithing. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. Consistent tithing. Stretch forth your hand toward me. Say, I'm a receiver of divine harvest. This is my year for consistent sowing, consistent tithing. 2012 will be a year of total obedience, and I will receive the divine reward. I receive the divine reward in Jesus' name. I want to pray a special prayer for new tithers, Pastor, before I have a special impartation. And uh, 
I want to pray especially for new tithers. Some of us have missed some tithe in the last 12 months. Not that we're stingy. Car breaks down, there's $700. Have to rush your child to the emergency, there's $2,000. But I'm going to pray for new tithers that 2012, no matter what happens, you will bring the tithe back to the house of the Lord. You will bring this. And Mike, I don't care what happens, God receives his 10% first. I want every person in this room, there's two things I'm going to pray over your life, and it's going to be exciting. For all of our new tithers, I'm going to ask the Lord to give you 12 months of perfect health that no disease shall come nigh your dwelling. Number two, that God will cloak you in divine favor, that everywhere you enter, there'll be favor in that environment towards your life. Everywhere you enter. Everywhere you enter. I want any person, every person here who missed any weeks of tithe in 2011, you didn't mean to, you're not stingy, you don't, you don't doubt God. You just think it's been hard. I'm going to ask every person who missed any tithe in 2011, but you'll take a new covenant with God, that 2012 will be the year of the covenant with God. If you missed any weeks in 2011, but you'll take a new contract with God for 2012, you will not miss a single paycheck of bringing the tithe to the Lord. Stand with me quickly all across this room. If you missed any tithe, in 2011, but 2012 is a year of a new contract with God. A new contract with God. Hallelujah. 